Hey there, this is Ari Witten. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. With me today is Dr. Thomas Hemingway, who is a board certified physician and the author of Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. And in this episode, we are gonna be talking about those five natural health keys to prevent the most common diseases, the most common killers in our Western world today. A uh, lot of good stuff in this episode, and he is a wonderful guy with a lot of wisdom to share. So I hope you enjoy this episode. So welcome to the show, Dr. Hemingway. Such a pleasure to have you. Oh, equally, Ari. I'm so pumped to be here. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So uh, you have a unique story. You were a conventionally, you are a conventionally trained physician, uh, but something shifted for you a while back, and now you've altered course. So talk to me about what you were trained in originally and sort of the events that put you on the path that you're on now. Yeah, man, would love to. It's been quite an interesting ride. And I originally did my training in standard U.S. medical school, top 10 school, UC San Diego, graduated top of my class, been in, you know, typical kind of hospital and clinic medicine for 20 years. I've been a board certified a uh, physician, mostly worked in the ER. In fact, I was chief of an emergency department for a decade. Um, really proud of what we were able to do in sort of that emergency environment. I really feel like in this country, we do have great emergency care. So if you're in the throes of an acute you know, problem, an injury, for example, or something that comes up suddenly, we're great at emergency care. But what I, what I noticed in over the years, this is kind of I think it really hit home once I was into my 40s. I'm actually turning 50 next year. So I started to see guys younger than I am either dying of heart attacks or having heart attacks in their 40s, sometimes even late 30s. And I just, I was scratching my head like we, we're, we're doing something wrong in this country. We're not really getting to the root cause of illness. We're really good, like I said, at emergency care. And we're freaking awesome at uh, shelling out prescriptions as physicians, but most of the time we weren't really getting to the root because actually heart disease is almost entirely preventable, yet it's the number one leading cause of death, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. I mean, we literally have hundreds of thousands of people dying per year, and it's preventable. And so seeing young guys either have heart attacks in their 30s and 40s or even seeing people die way earlier than they had to really kind of got me thinking. And, you know, I've always been somebody interested in natural and holistic means. When I was a teenager, I used to read books by Deepak Chopra, for example, and others that talked about Ayurveda and other kind of holistic styles of medicine. And I just thought, gosh, you know, we really should be incorporating this more into our everyday, not only Western medicine practice, but just we should really be getting to the root of illness and not just putting band-aids on and throwing prescriptions at people. So, that's kind of the short version of, of why I changed my whole trajectory. And about two years ago, I left standard hospital and, and sort of Western medicine to pursue more a holistic and integrative uh, career. So beautiful. So what are you are you still in practice in some way or are you mainly writing books and teaching online now? Yeah, all, all of the above. I'm, I'm still doing uh, consults, mostly, um, mostly virtual, although I do have a presence. I, I'm a medical director of a clinic in Florida right now where a friend of mine uh, got this clinic going a few years ago. It's an integrative health center, and I do see patients there both in person and virtually. Um, and where I employ mostly these sort of holistic and functional medicine approaches, I try really hard to not prescribe medication because that's usually just a Band-Aid fix. And it doesn't often get to the root. And so although I will, when necessary, you know, prescribe pharmaceuticals, I really try not to because most problems can be addressed deeper at a deeper level. And, and over time, many prescriptions can go away if we follow some basic principles, which I, I talk about in my book, which I, you know, just am passionate about. So you use the word preventable. Much of this disease, like cardiovascular disease, is preventable. That's the title of your book. It's called Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. So I want to dig into what your top five practices are. So what I think as a, as a broad overview before we get to those sort of more practical aspects of what you're recommending, when you say preventable, let's be specific. What, what are the diseases that you consider are preventable? 
Yeah, so right now, you know, about seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death worldwide are largely preventable. Number one, across the board, heart disease. In the US and literally every country throughout the world, heart disease is the number one killer. A close second would be uh, stroke and other sort of brain illnesses, everything from Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, and then cancer is usually number three, uh, three or four, depending on what country you're in. Diabetes is in the top 10 and its complications. And usually we're speaking of type two diabetes, which is basically nearly 100% preventable. Um, type one diabetes is actually quite rare. And, and actually the latest statistic I just saw was either, you know, 50% of the US either has diabetes type two or pre-diabetes. In other words, they have insulin resistance and elevated fasting blood sugar one out of two people in the US. So those, those are the ones, there's also kidney disease. Most of that's preventable, that's in the top 10. Uh, most lung disease, that's a top killer. Most lung disease is also preventable. So I think I've named about seven already, but uh, yeah, the, the, it's, it's overwhelming that most of these illnesses that are number one killers worldwide are nearly entirely preventable. There's obviously some genetic you know, element there, but what we've learned in the last, I would say decade is that the other layer called epigenetics, which is basically all of the other things besides what's in your DNA, it's what you do every day, what you don't do every day, what you eat, what you don't eat, if you move your body, if you don't move your body, what you're exposed to, you know, there's so many toxins out there in the environment now. And so all of these other things play into whether or not the genes that we actually have get turned on or turned off. And so that's the whole epigenetic phenomenon. And that's responsible for about 90 some odd percent of our illness. And only about 10% or less is actually from the DNA we were given by our parents. So it's actually largely under our control, which I find super empowering. <laughs> so th this is a topic that I think is widely misunderstood and, it, and it's an extremely important one because in sort of mainstream media and I think within also within conventional medicine, there is often an attitude of, oh, it's genetic. Oh, you know, you have the obesity gene, you have the, oh, heart disease runs in my family. Oh, um, diabetes runs in my family. Cancer runs in my family. Oh, do you have the breast cancer gene? Then you got to cut your breasts off, right? Um, there is often very frequently in our culture in this particular time in history, there is still very much an attitude of genetics equal one's destiny. And what you just said is that 90% as a generalization, 90% uh, of the disease that we're experiencing is generally through non-genetic factors. So how, how would you explain to someone who is maybe coming from that sort of paradigm of, oh, diabetes runs in my family. Oh, do you have the breast cancer gene? Oh, that means you're going to get breast cancer. How, how, how would you explain to them uh, sort of how would you talk them out of that sort of paradigm? Yeah. So the cool thing is nowadays there's actually data to prove this. In fact, some people would say even more extreme that 95, 96, 98% of what illness we come down with um, is actually what is not on the gene. So, so the genes, our genetic material, our DNA, obviously we get from our parents, right? But whether or not those genes get turned on or turned off, and we, we can actually study this. There's processes that turn on and off. This is called regulation of genes through processes such as methylation, for example. That's one that some people have heard of because I think the common sort of health uh, you know, uh, folks that are out there talk a lot about methylation. They talk about MTHFR, they talk about these kinds of things which are important, but it's an oversimplification. So there's a lot of processes in the body that get to decide ultimately if the genes we possess actually get turned on or turned off. And most of that has to do with the things that we do each and every day and the things that we don't do. And we, we actually have data to back this up. And so what I would tell people is that that was kind of the old school. That's even how I was trained back. You know, I was trained in the nineties in medical school and your genes were sort of like, you know, something that inarguably that was kind of like the biggest factor back in those days when we looked at sort of the pathophysiology of disease, we always focused on 
is there a genetic component to this? And I get that because that's what we saw at the time. That's what we assumed. Since I left medical school, we've been able to, you know, many times over, been able to actually see what the genetic material in the code, the human genome, right? That's, that's been done, right? It's been done now for a decade. And so we actually have all of those genes. And yet when we look at the diseases that are out there, yes, there is some play of the genetics, but most of it is actually um, in actual practice in, in, in the actual folks out there. Most of it is actually not due to the disease. So here's an example. So say you know, I, I have a patient that has the BRCA uh, gene, which is the one that gives you the susceptibility to breast cancer. And I have another patient that also has that. One of them develops breast cancer. One of them does not. They have the exact same gene. And um, what is not usually the same is all the other things that happen in their life, whether or not they're doing certain lifestyle practices, whether they're having good solid eight hours of sleep a night, whether their stress is under control, whether they're eating, you know, real foods rather than the stuff that comes in a package with 50 ingredients. You know, these are the things that really make the difference in the end. It's not just what's in your DNA. And, and so that's, I, I believe, and I take the approach, it's very empowering to know that you can't just blame your genetic material. You can't just blame your parents for everything. Maybe it's 10%, but many people would say it's actually less than that. If you talk to Bruce Lipton, he'll tell you it's 1%, mm -hmm. 1% of actually what your, your health looks like comes from your DNA and the other 99% comes from the stuff that you do and the stuff that you don't do. So I personally feel like that's very empowering. And the cool thing is we actually have data to back that up nowadays. Whereas when I was in school, that wasn't the case. And there was, I don't believe we even had the word epigenetics in the vernacular back in the nineties. I, I certainly never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. I, I remember I remember Bruce Lipton's book was one of the first books that came out talking about it. I, I think the, the main criticism of Bruce Lipton's work that I would have, I, th I think he was, I don't want to dis, you know, sort of um, detract from all of his contributions because I think he's made a monumental contribution, especially at that, that early phase, phase when the idea of epigenetics was really revolutionary. He made this contribution of, of saying, hey, it's not the nucleus in your DNA that's dictating your destiny. It's the instructions to the DNA, the signaling that goes into the nucleus. And um, I think the, the mistake he made from my perspective is, is to reduce all of that down to um, the psychological, the emotional, the what's going on mentally, right? He, he made it about what you believe and what's going on at a psychological level. And, um, and there are a lot of followers of his work that yeah. I've seen uh, who take that paradigm. And in my opinion, they extend it way too far. And there's, there's an yeah. enormous misunderstanding there, which is these people say, oh, you know, it's what my genes do is a function of what I believe. And so if I think positively and I have a positive mindset, then that's in that's epigenetics. That's influencing how my genes express. And I'm like, well, you know, that's yeah. a piece of it, but also how you eat and how you move and your light exposure habits and your thermal exposure habits and your sleep and your circadian rhythm and environmental toxicants and all these other different layers of inputs also have a massive impact on the expression of your genes. So it's a mistake, uh, a very big mistake, in my opinion, to uh, reduce the entirety of epigenetics down to the, the purely psychological realm. Yeah, well, well put, Aria. I have exactly that same um, understanding myself is that it's just one of those factors. And I think the oversimplification that you mentioned with just what your mind and your mental space tells your genes, it's definitely important, but there's so many other pieces to that puzzle. And I'm completely with you that the whole environment, the milieu, as we call it, you know, in the sciences incorporates that as one component. And then all the other things you mentioned are equally important. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. 100%. Okay. So we have all these highly preventable diseases that are responsible for roughly 80% of the chronic disease burden in the, in the Western world, in the United States in particular, 80% um, of the disease is preventable. They're diseases of nutrition and lifestyle. 
So your book is Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. So there's five things that you've zeroed in on that are key epigenetic switches, key practices that influence the expression of our genes to help prevent uh, negative health outcomes, help prevent disease. So tell, take me through those, those five practices. All right. Uh, so I, you know, like any good uh, physician that's been through medical school, I developed my own mnemonic or memory tool <laughs> to help the, you know, the layperson out there remember what these five things are. So it's F MSGs. So F MSG <laughs> and then an S at the end. I, we all hate MSG. That's pretty normal. If anybody, you know, loves that could, MSG, that like... could, I, I suspect that this is a more sophisticated mnemonic, but it could be very straightforward. It could be F MSG, F monosodium, mon, monosodium glutamate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so everybody knows what MSG is. So I figure that's an easy way to remember it. And we all hate it. So F MSG, and then you throw an S on the end. So that's the mnemonic. Uh, the first F is no surprise to most, it's food. Food is either your best medicine or it's a slow poison. And you get to make that decision several times a day. I mean, even Hippocrates over 2000 years ago said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And so that's really the backbone of all health starts with what lies at the tip of your fork. And just to put it super simply, I think most of us get this part is it has to be real food, whole food that you recognize that literally does not come with an ingredients list, the stuff that you recognize that grows in the field, the vegetables, the fruits, the well-raised animals, if you eat you know, meat and things like that, or, or wild-caught fish, like me in Hawaii, I love fish and I love ahi tuna and things like that. So the, the food as the first pillar is just indispensable. I mean, you, you cannot ever, and this is something I learned both in practice with, with many patients, as well as in my own personal life, especially after 30, I realized that I couldn't just exercise my way out of a crappy diet. Although we're told that we can, right? The calories in, calories out, you know, thing that we all hear about, nothing could be further from the truth. Food is not just simple calories. It's not just simple food. It's much more than that. It's information. It's also enjoyment. Like, if anybody's ever watched me eat, like I'm just enjoying my food. I love to be in company with my kids, my family, whoever. And I love to just eat delectable, amazing cuisine. Like I love eating as much as anybody, but if we focus on eating the real food that's natural and whole without, you know, a bunch of ingredients that we think or don't understand or, or should really be in a chemistry lab, we'll be much better off. So that's the first one. Food is the best medicine. The second one, so that's the F, <laughs> MSG. So M, Ari's got, got this already. He's talked about it briefly. Movement, movement is the M. And movement can be anything, really. Uh, I, I hate when people overcomplicate things because they make it not only unachievable, but kind of intimidating. We all sort of think, oh, to get our movement in, we got to like either go to the gym or we got to get a run in or we got to, we have all this preconceived notion in our mind of what movement equals. Movement equals anything. Like right now I'm talking to you, Ari, and I'm standing up. I can bounce up and down. I'm on a standing desk. I, I, I have a standing desk where I am right now, but if I don't, I put a cardboard box on the table and I make a standing desk because I can move while I work. I also keep, and, and this is, you're going to laugh, but I literally have a bunch of these things at the base of my desk. And I didn't even plan this. I just happened to have them all at the base of my desk and I can move little dumbbells in the middle of whatever, you know, every, every hour, not only does your performance kind of wane a little bit, but if you do two or three minutes of some kind of movement, every hour that you're working, both your mental performance, you know, everything goes up when you move your body. So it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as body weight exercise with things like you know, burpees or lunges or air squats, or my favorite is the plank. Like you do these things, you don't need any kind of weights. You don't need a gym membership. The important thing is that you move your body. My favorite actually is just going for a walk. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that so much. And if you can walk after every meal for like five or 10 minutes, not only will that decrease the spike in the glucose and corresponding insulin, making you less likely to be prone to this insulin resistance that nearly 98% of the population has, but you feel good, right? And it helps with digestion. So that's the M. <laughs> so F, uh, MSG. So movement is the M. The um, first S is sleep. Sleep is so dang critical. And I'll be honest, I was probably the worst offender in not 
appreciating the power that sleep can really afford us. I believed back in the day, especially when I did my training, that I didn't have time to sleep. I was going to sleep when I'm dead, right? The whole, I forget what it was, The Cure, 413 Dream, I think was the album. If any Cure fans out there, like there was literally a song called I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. <laughs> and well, I, I kind of live the, by that. The, the, the yeah. attitude that they take into um, residency in, in terms of training medical school residents um, who, are, who are becoming doctors in those three or four or five years, um, there's that attitude of, you know, making them work obscene amounts of hours and kind of this tradition of putting them through this very intense process uh, as a as a way to challenge them, you know, mentally. But the the downside of this, I, I read, I mean, apart from on an individual level, the 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 personal sort of suffering that the 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 doctor in training endures, but um, I think much more concerning is the amount of medical errors that result from doctors who are sleep deprived, who are being put through this. I read an article a few years ago. I don't remember the exact statistics, but there's an absurd amount of medical errors. People who are diagnosed incorrectly, prescribed the wrong medication, given the wrong treatment, uh, which sometimes can be fatal or extremely damaging for the patient. And it's like, you know, you, when you start to recognize that, you realize how stupid this tradition of putting these doctors through this, this arduous process of an intentional sleep deprivation during their, their training really is. Yeah, no, and it's, you've got that right on. And so the uh, sort of medical term for that is iatrogenic, right? Yeah. We actually caused, we collectively, meaning medicine, we've caused that either death or you know, untoward outcome. And depending on what source you read, some people quote it as the third leading cause of death in the US. And that's the number that's been thrown around. I, that seems a little high for me, having been in medicine for 20 years and in hospital medicine, both on, you know, the different areas, the wards of the hospital, as well as in the emergency department, where I spent most of my time, I certainly didn't see one of three deaths from that. But it definitely played into medical error, especially in the sleep deprived folks that are working the night shift. You know, the big joke is don't go to the hospital on a weekend, especially at night, right? Because all the A team is at home with their family and the B team is working. And that's not entirely true, but just being in that sort of environment with people that may be sleep deprived, the propensity or probability of having a medical error goes way up. And that that's easily studied, not just in physicians, but lots of data on airplane pilots, for example, and others that have this kind of thing studied that with just one night, lack of sleep in one night, your performance drops precipitously, you know, some somewhere between 20 and 35%, depending on what studies you read, that's literally the drop in your mental sort of abilities and sharpness and acuity in as little as one night missed of sleep. And so that's short term, but what, what we didn't appreciate, I think we all kind of know when we don't sleep well, we don't feel great the next day. But in addition to that, there's so many potential long-term ramifications. In fact, the WHO classifies shift work, which is what I was doing for many years, as a risk factor for cancer, as a carcinogen, because higher levels of cancer are seen in these people that work like the night shift, for example. And that's because of a lot of things. You mentioned circadian biology or the circadian rhythm. That comes up a lot with respect to sleep and I'll be honest, I was not trained to value my sleep, as you appropriately said. One of the reasons is we didn't understand it very well back then. This was 25 years ago. We didn't know that the most important time for your brain to be refreshed, rejuvenated, to dump out all the waste material that occurs in the buildup is at night while you're asleep. This whole glymphatic system that we now have a name for, that didn't exist to our knowledge in the 90s and early 2000s when I, when I did my training. 2000 and I believe 12 was when this was discovered by Dr. Jeffrey uh, Illiff and Nattergaard out of the University of Rochester, I believe. In 2012, this whole thing called the glymphatic system, which is sort of that flush, you know, it's kind of like the lymph of the body, but it's in the brain and it flushes out all the toxins that accumulate over the course of the day. You think of the things that you've heard of, like the beta amyloid and the tau proteins that are involved in things like uh, dementia, right? Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other associated dementias, those things get flushed out while we sleep. And if you're not sleeping, that process doesn't get to happen. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other 
amazing things that happen while we sleep, which is things like hormonal balance that can be responsible for not only things that we notice like weight gain, right? If you've been up all night, you get the munchies. Well, that's physiology. That's not because you're weak. That's because your hunger hormone ghrelin goes up, but not to belabor it. Sleep is so dang important. And I didn't appreciate it till about the last decade. I mean, I spent many years of my life sleep deprived and I'm not doing it again. I've repented, but I now know and appreciate both the physiologic significance and the benefits of having a great quality night's sleep. And you just feel good, right? I mean, I'm coming up on 50 and I feel like I'm a teenager. I have more energy than I've ever had before. I got teenage kids that I can keep up with. And, you know, it's a lot of that difference for me was with my sleep. I always ate pretty well, but I really didn't value sleep until the last decade. And so that's mm -hmm. the first S uh, of the mnemonic. So F. M, S, and then G, G is gut, gut health. And gut health was also a topic that I didn't learn about when I was in medical school. We didn't have a good appreciation of what this thing called the microbiota or the microbiome really was. And now we're really not only starting to understand this better, but there's actually quite a bit of data that looks into this that actually shows the importance of these many trillion bacteria viruses, protozoa, all these things that live in us, on us, within us. The, the biggest quantity, of course, is within our GI tract, from our mouth to our butt. That's where these guys mostly live. And what lives there is predominantly selected for based on the activities we do. So many of us just think about what we eat. And what we eat is a huge component, but also what we do. You mentioned circadian rhythm. Most people have no idea that these guys that live in the dark in your intestinal tract actually respond to light and dark cycles, just like we do. Most people have no idea about this. So, so when we respond to those cues and we get outside early in the morning to see that sun come up, not only does that set our circadian clock, but it sets theirs too. And if we want them to be our best ally, we gotta take care of them. So I, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about how to get your gut healthy, not just by simply what we eat, which is super important, but also what we do, because so many things are involved there. I think many people have heard just simple buzzwords out there, like 90% of the serotonin in your body is produced by your gut. That's true. You know, the happy hormone, and there's this connection between the gut and the brain, you know, that gut brain access, all of that is true. But I think what really hit it for me was the studies that have been done, for example, twin studies, where you basically look at the makeup of their gut bacteria in twins that are genetically identical, right? exact same DNA, and you have one twin that's lean, right? That's thin, that's not overweight, and his or her identical twin is obese or overweight. They have the same genes. It's not, we can't just blame that obesity gene that you talk about, right? They have the same dang genes, but what's different is their makeup of their gut flora, the microbiota, and they've done studies where they take a transplant, so a poop transplant, a fecal transplant, of the stool from the overweight twin, put it into a mouse that's not overweight, and they give it the same diet that they give this other mouse that's gonna get the fecal transplant from the lean twin. And what happens when they get the fecal transplant from the overweight twin, they get overweight also, like holy crap. And they have the same exact diet as the one that gets the, the fecal transplant from the lean twin. And that one does not get overweight or gain significant weight. So holy crap, like this stuff is legit. It's been well studied. And most of us don't pay any attention to it. So I dedicate a decent amount of time in the book talking about gut health. Excellent. Whew. Okay. So, and what's the last S? So the last S is stress, stress or stress, as I like to call it, the stress optimization. We need to optimize stress in our life. We all experience stress. In fact, before COVID, um, the landmark studies showed that 80% of us had some significant stressor or event throughout the course of one year that would happen in our life. Now, post COVID, that number is in the 90 some odd percent. And the landmark study looking at stress was in 2012. It was 180,000 patients. And what they did, this was super interesting. I haven't seen it repeated, at least to this scale. They took these 180,000 people and asked them to rate their stress. Do you have mild stress, moderate, or severe stress? And they got to rate it. And then the second question they asked was, do you believe that the stress is harmful to you? You know, that it might adversely affect your health. 
Or do you believe that it could be something positive? Could it be a growth experience? Like during COVID, many of us had to pivot our work because we couldn't go into a traditional brick and mortar place. We had to pivot a little bit. And so some of us were like, hey, this is a new opportunity to do something different. For me, at first, I was like, holy crap, my kids are all at home. Like, it's amazing. I love my kids. But like, sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of a break from them, right? But when I, when I sort of pivoted, I'm like, oh my gosh, what a blessed time in my life where my kids get to be home with me every single day. I get to be involved in their teaching and all that. I approached it differently. So what they found was this top tier group that had the highest level of stress, only those who believed the stress was negative or could be harmful to their health, those were the ones that had the negative health outcomes. In fact, it was like 30 or 40% of them had untoward health outcomes of that group. Of those that also rated their stress high that were in that same tier of the amount of stress, those that believed that it could be beneficial, it could be a positive experience, a growth experience, the stress was actually protective for them. In other words, they had a lesser chance of developing significant illness or dying early. And this is just a phenomenal study. There's a whole book that was written on this. I believe it was by Kelly McGonigal a few years back. And I don't remember the name of it, but she really elucidated a lot of these studies, shared how powerful the mind is. Not much different than Bruce Lipton, but this was looking at things like stress and how we do have a significant role in how that plays out in our body, how we give it meaning we get to choose the meaning of that stress. So there's, you know, I talk about that. I talk about a lot of different strategies we can use to reduce or just sort of, you know, deal with it, optimize the stress that we have, everything from, you know, breathing, movement, meditation, mindfulness. You know, there's a ton of different things we can be doing. But the cool thing is this also lies mostly under our control. We get to decide the meaning. So it's profound. It's, it's I think, just astounding how powerful we all can be and we get to decide whether these stressful things that happen to us will affect our you know trajectory in a positive way or in a negative way many people have said things like you know life happens for us and not to us if that's the way we decide and i really believe that we get to choose how that'll play out mm -hmm. i'm curious uh, of these five areas which are you personally most passionate about and, and most sort of interested in? Yeah, for me, um, it sort of depends on if, uh, if that question is for from a sort of physiological sort of scientific approach or just personally what has made the biggest impact in me. And, and the two that I'm always back and forth about because I've just found them to be so dang profound is the, um, the food that we eat or that we don't eat and how profound that can be an effect. And I, I didn't notice this, I'll be honest, until I was in my 30s, I could literally eat whatever kind of fast food or garbage was available. I'd do my exercise and I didn't feel like I really noticed much of a difference. And then as I got into my 30s and 40s and now coming up on 50, like I feel different if I eat food that's of low quality. And I noticed that, and part of that was when I started to pay attention to my gut health. So the food and the gut health for me are really just profound and they've been, I think it's, it's so fascinating. The gut health part, I am just super fascinated with, you know, some of these studies I mentioned about the fecal transplants and the twin studies and this kind of thing and the, the connection between the mind and the gut, you know, so-called uh, axis that exists there. I, I find that personally super interesting that bacteria can actually produce messengers. We can call them neurotransmitters. We can call them neural hormones that actually go to our brain that can tell us, for example, what to crave. You know, if we have the stuff that's not good for us that we don't really want in us, you know, the so-called uh, firmicutes, you know, phylum bacteria in us, they can tell us to crave junk food. Like they literally send messages to our brain that will affect how we think about food. Like whoever, like I was never taught that I'm fascinated with that. So I, I'm kind of a nerd and a geek when it comes to, I love to talk about gut health. It's just so profound and there's so much interesting data out there. The other thing personally that I love to speak on is just movement because it has made such a big difference in my body. Um, like if I'm having a bad day, you know, if I'm feeling really stressed or something happens, like actually during the, during the writing of my book, I had three quarters of it written and I was saving it onto an external drive to send it to somebody um, to review and some weird quirky thing happened and the whole thing disappeared. And Whoa. I couldn't figure out how to recover it. This was like 500 pages worth of manuscript. Wow. And literally poof, and one keystroke was gone. And I was like, 
I wanted to scream. I wanted to drop some four letter words. And instead, what I decided to do, I happened to be at Flo in Florida at the time where I could walk uh, to the ocean that was close to me. And I grabbed my surfboard. I literally went out for 15 minutes, caught two or three waves. And I came back and I was like, OK, now I can kind of approach this with a fresh set of eyes and ears and calm down. And, you know, and, and it was it made all the difference. So movement for me is one of the most crucial for not only how I feel, but how I can get things done. I mean, it gets my brain sharpened. And I, if I don't move every single day, like my wife will tell you, I'm kind of cranky. I got to move somehow. But the cool thing is now even just a walk does it for me. I don't have to get in my interval training every day, nor should you. You shouldn't do it every single day. A couple of times a week, fantastic. But anything that moves your body every single day, it'll just make such a difference, not only in your health, but I really feel like in your mind and your emotions and your spiritual health. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm curious, uh, given that nutrition and gut health are, are really big for you personally, those are big passions and areas of interest for you. What are your top three insights into how to optimize food, nutrition, and how to optimize gut health? Yeah. So uh, first and foremost is kind of what I was alluding to at the beginning when we talked about food is eat real food. So if it comes in a bag or a box or with a barcode, you know, the three B's as I sometimes will call them, most of the time we should be avoiding those things. You know, even the so-called health bars that are out there that are supposed to give us protein or energy, most of those have some not so awesome ingredients, whether they be just a ton of sugar or artificial sweeteners or bad oils. Many people have no idea that most of the food that we eat that comes in a package, not only is highly processed grains and sugars and, you know, gluten containing, which affects a lot of people, but it also has some really highly processed inflammatory oils, the so-called seed oils, right? The there's, there's eight or so of them that we really should try to avoid. Soybean oil is one of the most common. And we think soy, well, soy is a good thing, right? It comes from nature. And, but the soybean oil, hugely inflammatory, right? Safflower, sunflower, canola, grapeseed oil, all of these are so highly inflammatory and most of us have no idea. So that'd be my number one, eat real food, be cautious in anything that comes in a bag, a box or with a barcode. If it does, you gotta read those ingredients. You gotta make sure it doesn't have bad stuff in there, which is like I said, seed oils, highly processed grains, flours, carbs that are really ultra processed and just look for the additives. If it says a color and then a number after it, that's not gonna be good. Anything artificial, an artificial color, an artificial flavor, an artificial sweetener, you should leave it at the store, not put it in your cart. So that's number one. The second biggest thing I would say is really the timing of what we eat. So the quality of our food is number one, but the timing of that is almost equally important. And when I think about this, I just think about what we did thousands of years ago for millennia. Did we wake up in the morning and immediately start shoving breakfast into our mouths? Of course not. Like we didn't even have anything. There was no such thing as a pantry. There was not a refrigerator. There was not, you know, a convenience store or drive through or anything like that. We literally took a few hours, maybe even the better part of the day, trying to either find food that we could gather and eat or go on a hunt. Like we could not just eat the moment we rolled out of bed. And so I don't believe that our bodies were designed to eat 24 hours a day. In fact, the studies right now show that about 16 to 18 hours a day, most of us in the US are putting some form of calories or food into our mouths. That's just too much. So what I would say to that is for most people, like you don't have to feel like you got to go on these super ridiculous, you know, two hour window uh, feedings that some people are familiar with, like the one meal a day plan, you know, the OMAD diet or whatever, like that's a little bit too extreme. I, I personally, my goal for every single day is to have at least a 12 hour window where I'm not eating eight of those hours already accounted for while I'm sleeping. So that's easy. Then I just have a couple hours on each end of that. My, my goal is try to not go to bed within about three hours of having food because it'll mess up your sleep. Anyway, you're going to have poor quality sleep if you eat right before you hit the sack. Plus you need to give your body some time to digest. Digestion is energy intensive and you need to have some time to do that. And you need to have a break so that all that beautiful uh, process of the glymphatic system and, and um, the refresh, the rejuvenate, the flushing that happens, you know, the autophagy that everybody likes to talk about, all that stuff doesn't even happen unless we've been fasting for a certain period of time, somewhere between 12 and 16 hours. So 
overnight, I believe everybody should be able to accomplish a 12 hour uh, window of not eating. And then maybe add to that a couple hours on either end if you want to really get the, the best benefits from that. It doesn't have to be extreme. Though. I think too many people are looking for like a 16, 18, you know, these real long windows of not eating. And I think it's too much for many people, especially for women. Hormonally, women have different, you know, um, issues with these longer fasts. And so I, I just shoot for 12 hours. Um, and I think that's achievable from almost, from almost everybody I've worked with. So that's two. The third thing I would say is when you think about your gut, a lot of, a lot of us don't, well, I think now more of us talk about it, right? But, but before when I did medical school and whatnot, I, the only time I asked people about how they were pooping was if they had an acute abdominal problem. Like I thought maybe they needed a surgery or they might have a bowel obstruction or these kinds of things. And Otherwise, nobody really ever talked about like how often they pooped. Like if you're not pooping at least once a day, every single day, like you're not at the ideal optimal level for getting toxins out of your body. For example, you, sh you should be pooping at least once a day. I would say twice a day. And we, sh we should talk about it. You know, I think, you know, with the gut health kind of movement, we are starting to talk about that, but for adequate, you know, cycling, of all of these bacteria and getting rid of all the toxins. That's one of the biggest uh, things with, with the gut, right? Is that's an avenue for us to get rid of waste is to poop it out. And if we're not pooping for four or five or some, some people I know don't poop for a whole week, like that ain't good. That's not good for you. And so, so paying attention to those simple cues and then doing the things that will help that one is hydration. One is movement. You know, if you're getting out and doing some form of movement for 20 or 30 minutes every day, that's gonna help your poops. If you're hydrating really well, drinking roughly your body weight in ounces of water per day, that's gonna help a lot. But, but getting real regular that way is, is the start. And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that, that I add to it in the book. But I think those three things are, are easy. People can easily focus on them and it'll really move the needle if you start paying attention. Beautiful. Um, what about for gut health? Do you have maybe two tips that you can share with people before yeah. we wrap up for how to optimize their microbiome or their gut barrier integrity or anything along those lines? Yeah. So the biggest part I think for most people is to try not to screw it up <laughs> because a lot of the things we do screw it up. So if we eat processed foods, that makes us much more prone to having what you kind of refer to a leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability. And that's something that's now recognized that, you know, 20 years ago when I did medical school, nobody even that vernacular didn't exist. Leaky gut, like what's that? That didn't even exist. Well, they used to, not only that, but they used to um, make fun of people. <laughs> they used to make fun of the people in the natural health community talking about leaky gut and, you know, say, oh, you know, that's not a real thing and blah, 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 all those crazy quacks and their natural health alternative medicine stuff <laughs> talking about leaky gut. They don't understand real medicine. And now, of course, there's a huge body of scientific literature around intestinal permeability. And we know that all kinds of common things in uh, one's diet and lifestyle can induce it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we can measure it, right? We can measure the zonulin levels in the blood, right? That kind of gives us an idea of the permeability. And, and I didn't appreciate this stuff until the last decade because it really interplays with almost every other system of the body, right? We have this huge surface area in our gut. Maybe it's the size of a studio apartment. Maybe it's as big as a tennis court. We don't know exactly, but it's pretty dang big, right? It's probably the biggest organ when you unfold it of almost any in our whole body. And what we expose that to makes a big difference. So number one, avoid processed food, right? Especially for most people, gluten can be really sensitizing. And the reason for it is that you know, people argue, well, we've been eating gluten for thousands of years. We've been eating wheat. That's true, but it's not the same kind of wheat that we eat now. The wheat that we have incorporated into our foodstuffs, at least here in the U.S., is this dwarf wheat that doesn't look anything like the wheat that they used millennia ago. And it's so different, the properties and the processing, the amount of glyphosate and other pesticides that they spray on it. So most of us could benefit from either being gluten-free or just not having very much gluten in our diet. So that's number one, avoid the processed foods and especially things containing gluten. A lot of people get aggravated with milk products as well. Raw dairy is a little bit better, especially goat milk tends to be a little bit better tolerated. Um, cheese tends to be a little bit more tolerated for some people than, than drinking milk. And I'm, I'm somewhere, I don't believe that there's one specific food plan for everybody. Like anybody who tells you this is the food plan, run away. It's crap. Everybody is different. We're all unique. And that's the beauty of it. 
we are all unique. There's some basic principles like try to eat real food and not the processed stuff. I of course agree with that. But to say that there's one food plan that works for every single human out there, BS, right? We all grew up, if we look at our ancestry from where we came from, we're gonna have different nuanced, you know, not only genes, but, but also there's some data now showing that the epigenetic characteristics can also be passed down generally, generationally, which seems crazy, but we have data of that. And so we need to pay attention to our roots, to our, where we come from, what we've been eating for millennia. You know, you take the folks from Japan that for millennia have been eating rice and none of them used to get fat. You go, you go over there now and they're all eating McDonald's and all the other fast foods that, that we have sent them, right? Everybody wants to be like the U S and have all these fast food joints. And now that they have them in Japan, their obesity rate has skyrocketed. Whereas before they were, you know, they're one of the blue zones, right? They're one of the healthiest groups of people in the world. And they ate rice every single day of their life. Right? So it's every, every person is a little bit different, but if we pay attention to ourselves and our body have mindfulness about that and we and we stick to the basic principles of eating real food and not the highly processed stuff that's a fantastic place to start and, and looking at in the past what we have eaten like for example you know, there's a lot of talk about probiotics prebiotics you know the foods that contain lots of these you know for example the fermented foods everything from the sauerkraut to here in hawaii we love kimchi and the kefirs and and if you're, if you're out in Japan and those areas, they love the fermented soy products, right? The, the, the tempeh and the miso soup and all these kinds of things. And there's so many of these things available worldwide. And what I love to teach people is there's actually more that you can add to your diet than take away. Like there's a couple of things to take away, right? Take away the highly processed stuff, take away the high fructose corn syrup, take away the seed oils. Those are three big things you should take away. But think of the thousands of colorful vegetables, fruits, fermented foods. Think of all this amazing stuff you could actually add to your diet. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get a sense of that, go to your local farmer's market and try to see some of these vegetables, fruits, and other things that you've never seen before. And every week, try to add one thing to your diet. I focus on adding healthful things as opposed to taking away because nobody likes stuff to be taken away, especially if you got kids, right? You take something away from them, they go berserk, right? Nobody. And we're just like that. We don't like our stuff to be taken away. So a couple of principles about the things to avoid and then primarily help people know what they can add to their diet. And this is especially important with gut health. I think that's a beautiful thing to end on. Dr. Hemingway, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom, hard earned wisdom with my audience. I appreciate it. And uh, tell listeners where they can learn more from you and follow your work. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Easiest place to find me is either on my website, which is thomashemingway.com. I spell that just like Ernest with one M or on Instagram. I'm at dr for Dr. Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Um, the book, uh, it's called Preventable, as you said, and I have a website called thepreventablebook.com. But really everything can be found either on my link tree on Instagram at Dr. Thomas Hemingway or on my website, thomashemingway.com. They can also uh, check out my podcast, which is called Modern Medicine Movement, where I love to share these kind of holistic, natural health pearls with the world as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much, my friend. I look forward to the next conversation. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure, Ari. Thank you so much. Big mahalo to you and your listeners. Aloha. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next.